Hey everyone, it's Kim from Raven Kim Woodwinds, and today I would like to talk about a hot topic that I often see on the online ocarina community. The discussion and comparison of pendant ocarinas and transverse ocarinas. The transverse ocarina is the classical shape of the ocarina that most of us know. It was first developed in the 1800s by Giuseppe Donati in Bagrio, Italy. Donati's design was later expanded upon in the early 1900s up to the mid-1900s when the transverse ocarina arrived in Asia, uh, notably by the likes of Mr. Akita Gawa of Akita Ocarinas, one of the first ocarina makers who started introducing the use of subholes to extend the range of the ocarina. Now, the modern English pendant is a more recent design from the last century, credited to Mr. John Taylor, who sought out to create a smaller ocarina. They were developed as a compact ocarina that can be worn as a pendant, using only four to six holes uh, to produce fully usable musical scales. Number one, size. It's evident that the pendant ocarina is a lot smaller than the transverse ocarina. And this is usually the case when we're talking about instruments of the same key. These are ocarinas from the same maker, Focalink, both in the key of soprano C. These are soprano G ocarinas, one transverse, one pendant. Alto C ocarinas, one transverse and one pendant. Although it is often the case that transverse ocarinas are larger than pendant ocarinas of the same key, there are some exceptions to the rule. Now, regardless if we're talking about pendant ocarinas or transverse ocarinas, you're always going to get significant size difference within the same type. This one right here is a really, really small pendant ocarina. This one right here is a really big example of a pendant ocarina. This one's a really small transverse ocarina, and here's a really big transverse ocarina. Apart from size, one of the most noticeable differences between the two ocarinas are the number of holes. Transverse ocarinas usually have 10 to 12 holes, while pendant ocarinas usually have 4 to 6 holes. There's this common misconception that the transverse ocarina is a step up from the pendant ocarina simply because of the number of holes. There's also this misconception that the transverse ocarina is a more serious instrument than the pendant ocarina, again simply because of the number of holes. And this is simply not true. Um, both of these instruments have their pros and cons. Both of these instruments have their right place in the right musical context. And both of these instruments I love equally well. Now it's often mentioned that the pendant ocarina is a good starting point for beginners, but I beg to disagree. And that's because of the fingering system that we use with pendant ocarinas. Comparing the two, the transverse ocarina uses a linear fingering pattern whereas the pendant ocarina uses a cross-fingered pattern. A linear fingering system means that you get the notes of the diatonic scale by lifting your fingers one by one from right to left. A cross-fingered system uses alternating finger positions in order to get that same scale. One could argue that a pendant ocarina would use less dexterity than a 12-hole ocarina. While that is the case, a 12-hole ocarina is a better representation of the Western musical scale. So if you're an absolute beginner with no knowledge of music, the linear progression between the low notes to the high notes is a better representation of how music is written on the staff. Another big topic to discuss would be chromatics. Chromatics make a lot more sense when you're playing a transverse ocarina than a pendant ocarina. For the absolute beginners out there, chromatics are the notes in between the do re mi scales that we know. To better visualize it, let's think of them as the black keys on the piano. Both ocarinas are capable of playing chromatic scales, but there are some difficulties that we face when we have a pendant ocarina. There are actually some missing chromatic notes on the pendant ocarina. As you heard in that scale that I played, I was able to fill in those notes by using a technique called half-holding, which is just partially covering the notes. This is particularly difficult if you want to play in a key other than the primary of the pendant ocarina. There are exceptions to the rule, and what some makers do is they introduce 
thumb holes to pendant ocarinas or thumb holes that allow you to play chromatically. On this ocarina, I have to half fold the C sharp and the E flat. On this ocarina here, with one of the thumb holes acting as a sub hole, I can simply use my thumb to play those notes. In some cases, you see a full sub hole being added to the pendant ocarina, and it makes use of the other fingers that are otherwise unused when playing the pendant. With a system like this, the range of a traditional six hole isn't compromised, but with the instruments that use the thumb hole like this one, or this one, chromaticism is done at the expense of the range of the ocarina. And that brings us to our next point, range. In most cases, transverse ocarinas have a greater range than a pendant ocarina. Speaking in terms of the key of C, the highest note on the transverse ocarina, the F, is missing from the pendant ocarina. And in cases of a 12-hole ocarina where you have these two additional subholes, allowing you to play the low B and the low A. Without doing any fancy finger work or anything funny with your breath, a 12-hole soprano C ocarina gives you a note range from the low A up to the high F while the pendant ocarina gives you a range from C to the high E. This gives you one extra note above a pendant and two extra notes below the pendant. Whoop! I'm adding another thing again I noticed that I missed out on while editing the video. There are ways to extend the range you can reach with the pendant ocarina. If your ocarina has a shorter wind way, like this tenrai over here, you can use your lower lip to cover the fipple and get those lower notes missing from the scale. There are also other pendant ocarinas that allow you to cross-finger the thumbs or have additional holes that the maker adds to further extend the range. For example, this little wooden pendant here has the same range as a 12-hole ocarina. Given that pendant ocarinas are not as intuitive, have a narrower range, and aren't as chromatic as their transverse counterparts, why would you want a pendant ocarina? The most obvious answer is portability and size, but there is a lot more to that. One advantage that it has over the transverse ocarina is agility. Once you get over that non-intuitive cross-fingered system, you may find that you are able to play faster pieces of music on a pendant ocarina. Another advantage that it has over transverse ocarinas is ornamentation. Ornamentation are those little flavors that you add to your music to keep things, give things a little more flavor. Now it has a lot to do with the physics of the pendant ocarina, having larger holes in ratio to the overall cavity of the instrument. Things you do to create breaks between notes like cuts and taps are really really crisp on the pendant ocarina. Now talking about the choice between pendant ocarinas and transverse ocarinas, it's really a matter of context. If you need the full chromatic scale and if you need the ability to play in different keys, such as those required in playing classical music or grand cinematic pieces, then the transverse ocarina might be a better option. If you're playing folk music that has lightning fast passages, if you need the drama that you get from crisp ornamentation, and if you need something to take with you camping or hiking or maybe something that you carry every day into the office, then the pendant ocarina is a good option to have. It's not really a question of whether a pendant ocarina is better than a transverse ocarina. It depends on the context. It depends on the kind of music that you want to play at a moment in time. The only time that it should be a discussion of a choice between these two ocarinas is when you are starting out. If you have absolutely no knowledge of music and you're approaching the ocarina as a means to pick up music theory along the way, then definitely, definitely start with the transverse ocarina. The fingering system it uses is simply a better representation of music on a staff. If you want to start on the pendant ocarina, or if a pendant ocarina is the only one accessible to you, you can start learning on that as well. 
but take note it's not going to be as intuitive as playing on a transverse ocarina. That being said, pendant ocarinas require less dexterity to play. So if you're a clumsier individual and you feel intimidated by the 12 holes of a transverse ocarina, then the pendant ocarina might be a friendlier place to start. This question of transverse versus pendant used to be a big deal to me. I found as I progressed more and more on the ocarina, the less it mattered. Regardless of what you start out with, just have fun along the way. Eventually, you come to a point where you don't give much thought into the fingering system that you're using. Rather, focusing on the sounds and pitches that you can produce, letting muscle memory take over without having to think about where to place your fingers. Later on along the way, you might find yourself deeper into the rabbit hole, growing and growing and growing your ocarina collection. And you will realize that one system isn't necessarily better than another. It's simply a matter of context.